are attending the Belle Brewster Creek Board of Education. Today is Tuesday, December 3rd. Kevin, would you do roll call, please? Okay. Mrs. Betts? Here. Mr. Carpenter? Here. Mrs. Franz? Here. Mrs. Slaughter? Here. Uh, this meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not considered a public community meeting. There is a time for public participation during the meeting as indicated on the agenda. And we have put the, um, the communication segment before we make any decisions so that it gives you time to react to information that's given to us before we um, act on it. All right, so if you'll please rise and say the place. Yes. Yes. Uh, three different options. Just want to review real quickly uh, for everybody, in case you weren't here or in case you forgot. But uh, this one here is the forecast that was adopted by the Board of Education with the uh, budget reductions that are shown there at the top. I believe it's something like 2.4, 2.5 million total, and uh, no passage of a levy. And you can see we are still uh, at the end of the 23-24 fiscal year. 11.6 million in the red in the general fund. Um, it is illegal in the state of Ohio to be in the red in the general fund. I found that uh, what happens actually in reality is you uh, receive a citation on the audit and you have to borrow against future state receipts and then sit down with the state and they start cutting and, and things like that. So. Uh, but that, that's what we reviewed. At the, also at that meeting, uh, we don't have them with us probably tonight. We don't have the other two forecasts. But we looked at one with nothing happening. Oh, there we go. So that's one with the passage of the levy and the cuts, both. And uh, although it's a very small amount, we are in the black, positive figures, that last uh, bottom right corner there, June 30th, 2024. Uh, so. Uh, we did pass at that last meeting a resolution of necessity, it's called, uh, to be sent to the county auditor asking him to certify what dollar figure could be raised from a 5.7 mil operating levy. Uh, this is the first of two resolutions that are necessary to place an item on the ballot according to law. Uh, the response from the county auditor is included in your, with your agenda where he showed us that 5.7 mil would yield, according to him, an estimated $3,323,000. Uh, and then, so since he received our resolution, returned that certificate to us, if we wish, we then can pass a resolution to proceed. And one of those has been included in your agenda also, as prepared by uh, Dinsmore and Scholl, our bonding attorneys. Uh, and the filing deadline is December 17th. Uh, that's the time that we have to have the resolution passed. I have to get paperwork done deliver to the, to the uh, Board of Elections and uh, have stamps as being filed. Uh, also at that meeting, uh, the Board passed Phase 2 budget reductions, and Dr. Kozak, you want to review those this time? Yeah, just to, to kind of review all the budget reductions, because those kind of get you a, a picture of how we got to where we're at. So again, obviously the budget is our most critical issue that's facing the school district. So just kind of review some of those, those budget reductions over the past year and a half or so. The summer of 2018, we cut about $500,000 in our budget. Um, that included four teachers, part-time mechanic, and reduction in building and technology budgets, eliminated all day, every day kindergarten scholarships, and also reading, to, teach, or reading tutors during that summer. Um, and then June of 2019, after the levy, we reduced our expenditures by about $813,000. So that was two teachers uh, in music and in all day, every day kindergarten. We also uh, 
did not hire an intervention specialist that we were planning on at that point. Two technology aides, digital academy, a custodian here at the middle school, part-time cafeteria aides, uh, five full-time bus drivers, and another reduction in building budget, technology, and athletics, and also postponed the purchase of buses. So that's 11 more positions. Summer, and then we looked for other ways to reduce the budget this past summer. <coughs> So another $168,000, so two more teachers that we didn't replace, um, a Spanish teacher at the high school and then essentially a third grade teacher at, the, at uh, BCI. Um, and then, so that was phase one plus the additional money through summer 2019, this past summer. And then for next school year, this other million dollars, um, the teachers, we had a Memorandum of understanding at the last meeting with teachers, certified staff. They took a 0% raise for next year and no steps. Additionally, administrators and non-union staff took the same, took the same thing. Uh, and then we are also looking at for next school year eliminating three to five certified positions through attrition. So those add up to about over $2.3 million in budget reductions we've made since uh, summer 2018 and eliminated 20 staff positions and 10 certified uh, positions through that. So if you look at, if you go back to the, I'm not going to go to say it this one, I'll try to right, go right back. So again, we reduced by $2.3 million. So if we wouldn't have done that, we wouldn't have been able to get through next school year. Because another piece of this equation is since the levy wasn't passed, we lost about $3 million through collections next calendar year. So that's why the reduction in the $2.3 million. Um, so that really um, gets us to where we're at, uh, really needing a levy. Um, you know, we can get through next school year, but again, this is school years and, and taxes are collected in calendar years. So. Uh, the school year after next, we're at $1.8 million in, in budget reductions, or in the red. So you, again, like Mr. Lyman said, you can't uh, operate a school district in the red, so you'd have to make reductions of some nature at that point before that. And when a levy is passed, it'll collect it until next year. So we can't wait for zero to pass a levy uh, to take care of a problem like this. We have to get out in front of it as far as we can. And really it's best practice at a minimum to have 10% of your budget as your reserve there. So we have about $30 million budget. So we're at a, that's our maximum, that's our largest reserve. That should be your lowest, you know, the minimum amount. And so, you know, even in this scenario, you know, this year through this school year, we're at where we need to be minimum wise, but you know, anything below that really best practice not to have a, you need to have a reserve, just like in your household, you need to have a little reserve because if something comes up, uh, an HVAC system, you know, buses, those kind of things, those are a little bit more expensive in a school building, a school district than at your own house. You, know, you can talk hundreds of thousands of dollars for this kind of thing. And so, when we go to the other slide here, go to the other one. So even with the passage of a levy, you'll see that again, like I said, 10% of the budget is best practice to have as a minimum. So even with that, we aren't, we're only hitting that 21, 22, and it goes down to, at the end of the five-year forecast, about $7,000 in the black. So even with the passage of a levy, um, we still are at a, a critical point here. So that I just wanted to bring everybody kind of up to speed. I know I covered it last meeting, but again, um, to, to kind of weed through all those reductions that we've made. We've made a lot of reductions, and I want to again publicly say we are so appreciative to the staff, teachers, the class, um, <coughs> all everyone who has agreed to not have a raise next year. To us, that tells us that they really feel we are good with our budget. We're not in spending. Um, we just, we just don't have enough money. And 
say that uh, just so everyone's clear, uh, the conclusion of the whole thing is that uh, we are recommending uh, placing a 5.7 mil continuous operating levy on the March ballot, March 17th, I believe is the date. Uh, and like I said before, the filing deadline is December 17th. Great, great house, and um, I'm just reluctantly coming for you tonight, um, and um, would rather not be here. Um, it's nice as you are, um, um, but as I look at um, as I look at your bylaws, it says um, the board declares and thereby affirms its intent uh, under A for citizens shall be urged to bring their aspirations and concerns about the district. raising a concern I have about um, the education concern for my, uh, my children who are at the high school. Um, they participate in extracurricular activities, and um, for the last couple of years, I've been trying to work through the administrators um, to set aside uh, the exam week, that we won't be tasking our kids with um, non-academic non activities the night before their, uh, they have exams. Um, Exams are the single most important day of the school year. They it counts for 20% of their grade. Um, and um, this year I've got a child that's going to get on a bus at approximately 4 o'clock, have to travel over to Eaton, may get home um, tired and hungry between 9.30 and 10. Um, and, uh, you know, expected to get up the next day, take the language arts exam and the chemistry exam. And, um, you know, I know you. I've heard from two of you that you're going to look into it. You're going to follow up with me, and I appreciate that. Um, as you do that, I just would remind you of, um, again, your policy manual, uh, section 123, the Code of Ethics and Code of Conduct. Um, it says, while serving as a member of the Board of Education, each member is expected to agree to abide by the following Code of Ethics promulgated by the Ohio School Boards Association. Remember that my first and greatest concern must be the educational welfare of all students attending the public schools. So um, if I, I asked you when I reached out to you if, if you would just work through your administrators, and I've reached out to them in the 2017-2018 school year. I brought this to their attention. I brought it to their attention in the 2018-2019 to school year. And I've done it again this year. I've asked you to reschedule this, work with your work with your leagues, it's been league events, it's been non-league events, this year it's Eaton, uh, I think uh, last year it was Eaton at home, the year before that it was Carroll, my daughter who's at University of Cincinnati told me that it was Northmont one year. It seems to be a recurring uh, event, and I just ask you as a board to establish a policy. You have um, your school year lasts approximately 180 days. Uh, if you just set aside four days in December and four days in May, just for the students to be just students and um, schedule 172 days you've got to schedule all these other activities that will make our students and children well-rounded. Um, if you just bear in mind um, your code of ethics um, to you know, make the educational welfare their most important thing. Um, so I, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate your consideration on that and um, if you 
would. I know a couple of you said that you'd follow up with me. So I, I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, it's only because of my concern uh, over the last three years that I just want to express this in a public meeting. Uh, so thank you very much. Well, and thank you. Six months ago, I brought a concern to the attention of the board about transportation policies. And unbeknownst to me at the time, it was a moot point because it was already covered under the first phase of reductions as a result of the fair plan. And in that time, since then, I've spent time trying to educate myself about school operations because I got four kids and we moved here to Bellbrook five years ago for the schools and for the education because of the established pedigree of success. And it goes beyond just performances on state tests and academia. And it quickly became evident to me that the root of the issue, which is very complicated with the state funding model, which has been determined to be unconstitutional, is not something that's going to be fixed anytime soon. And I think you had already indicated that, that we have to act with a sense of urgency with regards to getting this levy on the ballot so we can figure this thing out. And it's, it's a polarizing topic because it's divided our community and put us in two very disparate corners. And, and you know, I can understand why there are citizens that are opposed to the levy, because, you know, I don't want to pay taxes any more than anybody else. I don't. I get that. I just also think that there's a lot of reasons why we need to consider supporting the levy, because of what's at risk with our students, and our educators, and their future. And I've been noticing a rise of support and citizens that are going out of their way, and they're doing research like the press knows, as well as Heidi Anderson, I read that stuff and it educates me and I would challenge our citizens within the community to look at the facts because if this thing goes on the ballot, we need to vote on the facts. It doesn't matter if you're for it or against it, vote on the facts, do your homework, engage in meaningful discourse, ask the hard questions, be willing to debate but be respectful. And I think if we can do that this go around, if we can educate everybody about what the facts are, then that's something that's gonna get us a win so that we preserve the quality of education. Because like you said, if we have people that are accepting a pay freeze, they're accepting a step freeze, and they're doing that to bite the bullet so that it's not our children's education that's being affected, then we owe it to them. And I think that's what makes Belbrook special. That's why people move here. That's why I moved here. That's why several other families moved here. And I don't wanna see us compromise the quality of our education because we can't put the interests of the collective we before me. Thank you. Thank you. I will say I do appreciate that more and more people are showing up here now to our meetings to be able to hear what's going on. Um, we don't always get into a discussion, but you are hearing what we're, you know, what's going on. selfish reason. It would be great to have the other tax rather than this one, but regardless, it's a no-brainer that this community needs this. We moved here recently. We don't have children here. We do have grandchildren in the district, and it's really important that people set aside their own selfish beliefs so that we as a collective, just like the gentleman said, can work through this and keep Bellbrook schools. Bellbrook schools are really famous. We moved from out of state, and we were amazed at the realtors kind of guiding us here, I should say pushing us here, saying you will not regret it, this is the place to be. And we knew of, of the turmoil when we moved here. The other thing I want to say is thank you very much, and I'm sorry I don't know your name, but um, for those of you who haven't followed it, she and her husband, what's your name? Diana. Diana, thank you. They have diligently worked to break this down for we regular people who don't necessarily understand this, and I'm pretty sure the board all is aware of that, but I really want to thank you, and you don't deserve the treatment that you have received from various members of this community. Thanks, I totally support you.
member of the Special Needs and Parent Advisory Committee that just recently formed. One of the things that when, when my son Danny, who's in the first grade at Stephen Bell, when he was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum disorder, uh, he was three years old, as a parent, you go through a lot of things in your mind, you know, a lot of worries of the future, a lot of things that, 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 that worry you. One of the things that didn't worry me was being in Belmont School District, because I figured, well, no better place for us to be, and not just because of, of the reputation of the district, but ties to community and those things that my, my child would receive the best of education. Uh, unfortunately, the reason I feel that the, the special needs committee needs to be formed because that hasn't been my experience. Uh, my experience has been quite negative. Um, shortly, when I first started on this journey, I assumed IEP meetings were a team meeting where everybody gets together, we're all focused in the same direction, all trying to do what's best for my son. That is the experience, now, not just me, but many special needs parents in our community feel the same way. I can't, we, when we first started talking about this committee, I've had multiple mothers come up to me in tears, literally, not figuratively, literally in tears, wanting me to go to their IEP meetings with them to be their advocate. Feeling put upon, feeling isolated, feeling that it's literally the team, which is the school's team or the district's team, against them, okay? That should be, that's not the way this thing was designed to work. Okay, much less in a community like ours, all right? I had, the, the only way this changes, it changes with the school board, the superintendent, special ed director, everyone else being on board. You know, we wanna see actual inclusion. What that looks like is general education teachers being trained in what inclusion looks like for special ed students seeing an actual commitment from the district as a whole to put special education at the forefront. One of the things that the superintendent mentioned starting a meeting is saying about the, you know, the financials are the most critical problem. Those get fixed. This is a critical problem, okay? And this needs to be fixed. You, you should not have mothers in tears scared to go to their next IEP meeting because they feel like it's us versus them. I had an incident last year with my son where his well-being was placed in peril. Okay, and Dr. Kozak, I've, I've ran into you multiple times. Not one time did you pull me aside and say, how's Danny doing? That gets under my skin, okay? You might have asked Ginger King, but you never spoke to me directly. You haven't spoken to my wife from any time you've been with her. That's the lack of intestinal fortitude that you see from the district as a whole regarding this with special needs and that needs to be addressed. Okay, because those are the kids that actually need you guys the most. And those need to deserve the most attention. And thank you for addressing us. I unfortunately do have time. I, I, know. I have a few thank questions. You. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I wanted to speak with you. I spoke to David Carpenter. Since you two are the returning school board members, I wanted to speak with, with both of you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary I'm sorry, I should have known that. I'm sorry, I've been out of touch. <laughs> and Mary also. I, I, I just want to say, before Ginger can ask her question, I have been on this board for 30 years. Nobody discovered we had school board meetings except for staff until about a year ago when someone decided to stir, up, stir the pot a whole bunch. So now everybody's come to the meetings and that's great. But I'll just say that no one has called me to talk to talk about the exams. I haven't talked to, to you about the exams and their kids and the sports and all that kind of stuff. And I and I haven't talked with you. I would love I would love to meet them. So you know it's just we can't be expected to know every little thing that's going on in the district. And our job is not to um, deal with the administrators. That's the superintendent's job. Our job is to go to him with concerns that we have, and then he goes to the administrator. So, you know, I I welcome your comment, and I'll do all I can to see, to see if something can get done. But just, I'm here. I would love, I would love to be with you. 
absolutely. And we can't set that up so we can meet with the, not that I'm leaving the, 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 the party ones, but I know that in January, I guess, the board changes. So I would like to meet with you guys whenever possible, please. That was disappointing about your IEP meeting. It's, uh, when it first started, like I said, I expected it to be a team. You know, everybody gets together. Obviously, as parents, we have tremendous input because no one knows our children better than we do. Um, to me, it seems that part of the problem is when you have professionals that don't necessarily have a great deal of interaction with the children, and yet they're the ones that are designing a lot of what goes into the IEP. I, I think that, I'm sorry, no. No, you go ahead, go ahead. I, I just think it's almost like there's a game plan with the, on the professional side before they meet with the parent. Well, that game plan, the parent needs to be the, the quarterback. The parent's the one that needs to direct and see, well, if you think this is what's needed, tell me why, tell me why this isn't needed. Have the parent's input, and that's one of the things we're trying to do with the Special Needs Parent Advisory Committee, is when you design things as a district, parents, especially special needs parents, need to be in, from, in the beginning. Because once you start on going on, on the wrong path, you'll never get back to where you need to be. And then you see these outrageous things occurring because our starting point is wrong. So parents need to be vital. Because you know uh, there's a, a, a great writer who's actually on the spectrum. And she, she says that if you know one autistic child, you know one autistic child. Because every autistic child is different. And those things are not copy and paste, they're not umbrella fixes. Each child is individual. And I think the parent's input when you decide what's <coughs> gonna be done on the IEP should be a huge percentage of what needs to be done. And then the services that are needed need to be provided in, in a manner that, that's a priority for the district. Okay, so did you report this to anyone? Yes. Who did you report it to? Everyone. I, I sent an email to Dr. Kozak, Andrew Keaton, uh, Tanya uh, Wilson. Uh, we had uh, my son, I pulled him out of school um, for about three weeks, four weeks. Uh, he went back to school with me as his aide uh, for several days. Uh, then I was able to, trade, uh, to train an aide uh, who's working with him and has been working with him uh, because this happened in kindergarten, so he's in the first grade now. Um, and. Everyone, uh, everyone, there was multiple meetings before I would ever let my son go back to school, thankfully. So are things going better now? Yes, fortunately they are. Okay. Fortunately they are. So what recommendations do you have for us? Um, I, I would like to see, and that's just, we're, we're addressing actually with a special, we have a couple of people with a special needs advisory committee <coughs> who are sitting back there. We're addressing several things that we want to see. We want to see education for general, like continuing education for general education teachers regarding inclusion for special ed. What does true inclusion look like from a district level of how we're not just warehousing kids in terms of general ed, but actually having fully integrated members of those classrooms. Um, there, there's, there's quite a few. We're actually, we're trying to actually do a um, information packets for parents that are first starting on this path to so special needs. It sounds like a lot of good things yes. are starting to happen. Yes, I hope. I'm and hoping. we can't do everything right away. We're starting. Absolutely. Having the committee, working with time, working with the teachers, we're, we're trying to <coughs> let you know, guys, we're hearing you guys. We're trying to establish some new things. Good. So we hope that you can be part of the changes that we're trying I would like to make. To and we thank you for. Thank you. Please keep bringing those concerns. I will. I will. I would like to say I would still like to meet with uh, Mr. Carpenter with his friends. I forget you this time. And, and you and all and, uh, okay. if you can. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the holiday call? Yes. Okay. This is also a special ed issue, correct? Yes. Mine started in 2016. 2013. My daughter was asked by her doctors to get a CPT because she has very low vision. Since 2013, I have bought and bought and bought and bought, and I have emails with almost.
almost everybody, discussing, please give my daughter stuff she can see. She cannot see well. They don't use her CCTV, which is on her IEP. At the beginning of every IEP meeting, that's the first thing I hear, is that they're not following the IEP. This year, my daughter has not set foot in school. She had a surgery, she's been out of school. I have been unable to get her appropriate classwork. I've been able, when they send it to me, they send it in such a tiny font that even I can't read it. They send me, when I complain about it, they get ridiculous and they send me big, long sheets of paper along with a tiny little book that still has that 12 point font that she's supposed to answer the questions with. She has received 59% of her home instruction this year that she should have, 59.7. I don't know district-wide, you know what a 59.5 is, but that is a D minus. 59.4 is an F, which states, you guys are failing my daughter. I've talked to multiple people. I've talked to Tanya, I've talked to administration, I've talked to you, Dr. Kozad, at the beginning of the year. I brought up some issues. I have so many more issues due to time limit. I'm not going to discuss them, but I'm begging you, please provide an education for my child. She deserves it just like anybody else. I have been over backwards. I have been <coughs> patient. We're talking 2013, six years of her life. I have been fighting for her to be able to see her work. She's a straight A student. She works double hard so that she can see. And you guys can't just give her stuff that she can see. I have examples back there that show what they've given me. This year, as recently as last week, I begged, coming to you, you guys haven't followed IEPs, with three of my special needs kids. I have five in the district, three special needs, too typical, and I promise you, even my 13-year-old daughter knows that she is receiving a better education because she is a typical child. That is not acceptable at all, and I expect something to be done. This is most important, not the money. Unfortunately, education. Up. Are you on the committee also? I am. Good. Thank you. Uh, what grade is your daughter in? She's a junior in high school. Mrs. Cross. Please don't give up on us. Please keep giving us an update of how this is going. I'm not going to be quiet again. You will hear from me next time about my son's problems. Okay. And we have two people who would like to talk back to Pat. Um, Diana. Facebook page. Uh, great introduction, thank you. Um, it started as a place to counterbalance negativity with kindness and has evolved into a platform to share research into what levies are and how you guys use the money you get from the taxpayers. Our eventual plan is to put everything we've learned into a website and share it with the community. To this end, we're checking and double checking everything we're learning. We'd like to review a few key topics with you and would appreciate it if you'd bring any inconsistencies to our attention after the meeting. The biggest question we had, and we knew others had, was, why do you keep asking for more money? From what we've gathered, the simple answer is that the Ohio Constitution says so. It has specific laws that limit non-voted property taxes and how a school can gather additional funding beyond what's guaranteed. You're given two options. The first is to get the state to increase how much it's putting towards education as a whole. After reading up on the history of other schools that have attempted this, our personal conclusion is that it won't happen anytime soon, if ever. The second option, which the state not only seems to prefer, but encourage with a heavy hand, is to gain additional funding through the passage of regular local levies. The expectation is that when utilized on a repeat basis, local levies will ensure that schools stay properly funded, right? That led us to our next question. Why can't levies just be one and done? This is how we discovered House Bill 920 and the effect it has on levies. 
Everyone knows that stuff gets more expensive over time. That's inflation. It's expected. But what's also expected is that incomes go up over time too. So overall budgets shouldn't, in theory, change much. It doesn't work that way for public services like schools, does it? HB 920 essentially puts a stranglehold on your income. It stops any levy we pass from going up with inflation, locking it in place the moment it's agreed to. So while the cost keeps going up, your major income source doesn't. The example we came up with uses the 1973 levy that's still in effect. A $20,000 home back then paid $28 a year for that levy. Today, that home's worth $116,000. Best guess. But you're still only getting $28 a year from that levy. And $28 does not go nearly as far as it did in 1973. <laughs> we used the proposed levy to create an example into the future as well. If it were to pass, the same $116,000 home would have to pay an additional $20 a month in taxes. Now, using the expected inflation rate of 2% annually, that home will be about $128,000 in five years. Due to House Bill 920, the 5.7 levy will still only cost $20 a month in property taxes, despite the home now being valued at $12,000 more. This means it will no longer be a 5.7 mil levy, it's now only a 5.16 mil levy. Just like the 1973 levy went from being a 4 mil levy, what is now a 0.7 mil levy. The only conclusion we can draw is that HB 920 creates a situation where any levy passed will become so devalued over time that it becomes useless. The next big question we had, and we have heard, is where does the money go once you have it? This one is, sounds simple on the surface, and yet is an exceedingly complex answer. On the surface, a school's income is used for one thing, educating the children that attend it. On average, the cost to do this in the U.S. is $11,800. The average cost in Ohio is $11,900. So we wanted to see what you were spending per child. We divided the total expenditures you posted for 2019 by the 2019 K-12 student body population, which was at bottom of the five-year forecast. We got $10,900 per student. You are spending nearly $1,000 less per student than the state and country averages. With that in mind, you don't appear to be overspending. That isn't what most thinks about when it comes to expenditures, though. They want to know where the money is being spent. Looking at financial forecasts, the large portions seem to be exactly where most businesses spend the majority of their income on payroll. We counted a total of 280 employees, 104 are classified, and all but 12 of them are hourly. 175 are salaried, certified staff, and 161 are teachers. 15 of them are in the central office, like the school psychologist and the curriculum director. There's been a suggestion that too much of the school's income is going to salaried staff, namely the teachers. And since we're trying to consider all the angles, we've looked into it. Now we know a teacher's value is more than how much they're paid, but that doesn't impact their cost. The things that do are inflation, experience, and education. Inflation should cause every employee's wages to rise over time. No one should be making the same today that they were 10 or 20 years ago. Experience and education are also quite often factors in how much salaried staff get paid. A senior engineer that I hire with a master's degree is going to be paid a lot more than a person I hire with a bachelor's. Given that these are often reasons for paying staff more, the fact that the same pattern played out when we looked at the list of teaching staff was not a surprise. 80% of the teachers here have a master's degree, and the average years of teaching experience is 17 years. We then considered the concept of a salary cap at 60,000, given that information. 125 out of 161 of your teachers make more than that, don't they? That's 78%. That's a lot of teachers to lose because of inflation, education, and experience. Even if you were to take education experience off the table and only raise their salaries to account for inflation, you'd still have to show folks the door yearly until you couldn't hire anyone at all. The federally expected 2% interest inflation rate is expected, is planned, and would eventually raise even the starting pay for a brand new teacher to greater than the suggested 60,000 cap. We did the math, and using the current teacher salary schedule, the cutoff for anyone with zero experience in a master's degree would be 10 years. In 15 years, we wouldn't be able to hire a graduate with a VA. There just isn't a solution, simple solution for anyone, is there? We don't get the impression that you guys have like having put levies on the ballot, and no one likes to pay more in taxes. Add in the ever-rising cost of everything, and it's a recipe for both heartache and headache. Still, we can see that you're trying to minimize that as much as you can. The cuts you've made have all had at least the least amount of impact you can on the student body. Thank you for that. As parents of children in this district, you have our gratitude for keeping them as sheltered as possible. 
The staff, too, deserve a great deal of appreciation for their willingness to put our children's needs above their own. That shows real love for our students. Whatever happens in March, we know that we made the right decision to move our kids into this district and more care. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, we do. Mr. Carpenter? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm rattled. Okay, do I get a second? Just wait here a second. Second. I thought I got this. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. France? Yes. Mrs. Slaughter? Yes. Mrs. Stacks? Yes. Motion passes at 